church. How are we doing today? Come on, let's stand on our feet. It's a great day. In the Lord's presence, he's here. He's faithful. Come on, let's worship our God today. Let's give him the glory he deserves. And open our hearts in worship as we sing this. As I reflect, I find perspective. There in the best and worst days of this life. You were always on my side. You're in the pain, you're in the promise, and on the days the furnace finds my faith. You're the fourth within the flame. Come on. I don't need to know what the future says, because if the past could talk, he would tell me this. My God isn't finished yet. behind me cause through the highs and lows and in between God you go ahead of me and when you call me I will follow and if the water folds beneath my feet then you'll pull me from the deep I don't need to know what the future says can trust him this morning. Let's put our trust in him today. I don't need to know what the future says, because if the past could talk, it would tell me that. Well, let's sing it out. My God isn't finished yet. If he did it before, he can do it again. So I'll trust him with what comes next. Cause my hindsight says I can count on this. My God isn't finished yet. If he did it before, he can do it again. So I'll trust him with what comes next. For the God I know is known for faithfulness. It's an incredible day in God's presence. As we reflect this morning, you know, in this season, we think a lot about what Jesus has done on the cross. Lord, he's made us free. We don't just celebrate that on Easter. That is our message every single week, that the blood of Jesus heals us and we are free in him. Amen. Well, let's lift this up this morning. I 
Come on, celebrate that this morning. Give him praise. Amen. Let's give him praise. Awesome. Well, good morning, that church. Y'all can have a seat. My name is Jessica, and I'm the communications and marketing director here at that church, and I'm just so excited to welcome you to our services this morning. You know, as they were just singing about, you know, we rolled the stone away, we see the empty grave, and that's the whole reason that we even have to celebrate in the first place. Isn't that awesome? You know, I think so many times it's easy for us to just come to church week in and week out and take for granted the fact that that's the whole reason we're here in the first place. We have the opportunity to sing hallelujah and thank God for what he has done through sending his son and raising him to be with him. So awesome. Well, um, for those of you that maybe this is your first time, you received actually a welcome and a worship guide as you came in. And at the bottom of that worship guide, there is a connect card. And on that connect card, we just ask that you just fill that out. If this is your first time, just you can hand that in on your way out. We've got a gift that we'd like to give you. But more than anything, we don't want your information just to have your information. What We want to be able to partner with you in prayer. Maybe there's something that is going on in your life and you just really need somebody to be lifting that up. We would love to be able to support you in doing that. And that's why we're here as a church. We want to be able to pray with you. We want to be able to partner with you. And hey, maybe there's a next step that you need to take. Maybe you're interested in getting started and serving or, you know, taking that next step in baptism. We're going to talk more about that later. But that's a great way to do that by filling out that Connect card. I just want to remind you, as we just transition into our time where we give of our tithes and our offering, that we've got three different ways to give here at that church. The first one of those is online. You can log on to our website, www.that.church. You can set up recurring giving. You can set up it, set it up to be weekly, monthly, whatever it is that works with you. Um, but to give of our 10% of our first fruits, because I know Pastor Fernando, he was talking last week about how when we give, I think sometimes it can be hard to find obedience in the season that you're in. You know, this is a command that we've been given. This is a way that we are obedient and faithful to what God has provided us. And it's it's His anyway. And so He asks we, that we give the first 10%. And so that's what we're going to do during this time right now. So I'm just going to ask our guest services volunteers to come up as we prepare to give and just bow with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather and to give and to just serve you and learn more about the heart of who you are. God, I thank you for these gifts and these tithes that are about to be given. God, I pray that you would just be able to use these the way that you see fit here and in our community as we just work to know Jesus and make him known everywhere. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Awesome. Well, as they're coming around, uh, as most of you may know, last week and here in the month of April, we are in a brand new teaching series called Awesome Relationships. Who could get excited about some awesome relationships? Yes. The thing about relationships is that's the basis of, of what we do is connecting with one another. And there are so many different areas where we experience relationship. Last week, we talked about friends, and maybe some of you, you know, got connected and you made some new friends this week. Maybe you saw that that was a need. Maybe you got involved with Point Man or Real Women for the first time. Did anybody do that? Nobody. Okay, great. So maybe you have another opportunity to do that this week and get involved there. We would love to have you. But speaking of family, I brought some of my family with me this morning, and so I'm gonna ask them to come out. We're gonna have a little fun. Do y'all like to have fun? And if you don't, we're going to do it anyway. So I'm gonna turn it over to our worship pastor and a crew that he's got, because we're family, and we're gonna celebrate that today, okay? So we need y'all to stand on your feet for this one. Come on.
How much fun is that? <laughs> that was so awesome. They asked me if I would come out and dance with them. <laughs> nope. Not going to happen. There's, uh, we got to know our gifts and talents. You know what I'm saying? Properly evaluate those things. So, man, what a great day it is. I'm so glad you guys are here. We have got at such, uh, this message series, I believe, is just right in the middle of some things that we need to hear. And, you know, last week we began to realize that our friendships need to be real intentional. Um, there's some significance to the types of friendships and how we influence friends, and it's, there's a biblical approach to that. And if you wasn't here last week, I'm going to encourage you maybe to watch that online because it's a, I think it's a great lesson for us to, to take in. But, you know, today we're going to talk about awesome families. And I don't know of anybody who doesn't want an awesome family. I mean, I want an awesome family. You want an awesome family? Heck Yeah. And you know, today this message is going to be, um, it's going to fit you if you're a family of two, husband and wife, or if you're a family of a bunch. I was um, counting last night, my family, um, our immediate family now is 14. We have passed the Waltons, you know what I mean? When you say 14, that's like a classroom, you know, an army. I mean, we've got it, and it's awesome, and it is a lot of fun. You know, an awesome family, an awesome relationship, there's some, there's some intentional work that has to go into that, some stuff that we have to really focus on and, and consider if we're going to have an awesome family. It reminds me of there was a couple um, that had been married 60 years, and, um, and they asked the man, they said, you know, what was the secret to their 60 years of marriage? He said, it's easy. He said, when my wife and I first came together, we made this agreement. I would make all the major decisions. She would make all the minor decisions. And he said, it's worked out great. He said, in 60 years, we haven't had a single major decision to make. <laughs> yeah, truth, isn't it? Yes. So, so anyway, but we're going to talk about an awesome family. I want, to, I want you to listen to what the Bible has to say, the promise of an awesome family, what our, our family, the product it brings, and, and what God has given you a chance to be a part of. Because sometimes we think about missions work, and we think about going overseas and these kind of things, and I think that's true too. But what if I were to tell you that your family is one of the greatest missions work that you'll ever be a part of on this planet? It's an incredible opportunity that God's put in front of us. So let me show that to you. Psalms 112, I've got various verses that I'm going to use through Psalms 112, but it's in your outline and you can look at this with me. It says this, How joyful are those who fear the Lord and delight in obeying His commands. Their children will be successful everywhere. 
An entire generation of godly people will be blessed. They themselves will be wealthy. Now, success and wealth, are gonna, we're going to define those here in a minute, so don't get ahead of it. And their good deeds will last forever. They are generous, compassionate, and righteous. Those who are righteous will be long remembered. And God says, you know what? In your family, the way we, we, we um, work and serve our family, the way we direct our family, the way we shape our family, there's some benefits to it. God says there's a success that's there. There's a wealth that's there um, that we can have. Now, here's the problem. The problem is, is our culture has a certain idea of what a successful family looks like. And if, it's, if you've got your outline, you ought to look at it right here. Culture says that our success as a family is having more and being happy. I mean, you've heard it. I mean, you heard it when you were a kid. Our parents said it to us. It's, I call it the parental curse. They looked you in the face and they said, you know what? I want you to have everything that I didn't have. You've heard that before? I want you to have more than I had. I didn't have anything. And I want you to have more. I don't want you to have to go through what I went through. I don't want you to have to endure what I went through. And we as parents have been cursing our children for a number of years with that. And so what's happened is we created a culture out of kids that makes us believe that, hey, you're not successful and you pa- until you pass up what your parents had. So you have more. And we're not talking about character when we say that to our kids. We're we're not talking about them loving God more. We're not talking about them having a greater knowledge of God's word. We're not talking about them caring for a world and serving people greater than us. We're saying, hey, we want you to have more than we had. It means we want you to have a bigger TV than we've got, a bigger house than we have, a car with bigger wheels, whatever. you know. And so we set this economic sort of strategy, and we kind of throw that on our kids like you're vomited on somebody. We want you to have more than we had. And so a kid goes into the world thinking, you know what? The only way that I can be successful is if I have more. Our culture says, if you have more than your parents, you're a success. You're a second generation success because you have more. Or being happy. We've heard that. Man, we've launched a world full of people who believe that the ultimate goal of life is for us to be happy. Happy means that good things are always happening to you and you can always smile about it. Is that realistic? Absolutely not. But that's what we shoot for. And unfortunately, we've not come to the grips with what God says about what it means to be a successful family. Which, let me just give you one verse of Scripture, and this is one that I think about quite often. When we throw in our kids and we say, you know what? For you to really be successful, you got to have this, and you got to be more than us, and you got to be greater than this, and you got to have this kind, of, this kind of vacations, this kind of house. Jesus said this in Matthew 16, 26, and listen to what he says very carefully, because this is one of those questions where Jesus just lobs it into the room, and he just lets it hover there. Here's what he says. He said, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world? That means you won, you won the world lottery. You got everything. You got all the success you could possibly have. You have all the ownerships, all the toys and trinkets. You've got the big house, the great vacation. Everything looks fabulous. Jesus says, what if you got all of that? Now listen to this. What if you got all of that, yet you forfeited your soul? Jesus gives us this real comparison and contrast to think about for a moment. What if... What the world has to offer, I mean, you name it, you got it. Whatever you're aspiring to be, have, do, whatever, you got it. You're at, the, you're at the top of it, the pinnacle. You're on the top of the heap. He says, what if you had that, yet to get that, you forfeited your soul? And what we gain in life, how long is it going to last? It's going to last a lifetime. You know, you can collect as much stuff as you want to. It doesn't extend your life. It's, you're not going to enjoy it longer than while you're here. Had an uncle, super wealthy, had all kinds of businesses and all kinds of stuff. And you know what he got right after he died? An estate sale. He did. People were coming with trucks and, and trailers and to cart off all his stuff. We can't wait to get his stuff. We're going to have his stuff, and then what will we have? We'll have it for a while, and then we'll have an estate sale. Jesus said, I want you to think about this for just a second. Before you put all your energy into trying to pursue what the culture and what the world says is successful, you better think about what happens after the door closes on this thing and you enter into eternity. What about then and there? And that's exactly what he's saying. So what God says success in a family is this. And I believe this is a really successful family. It's when we are as a family, we're loving God and we're putting him first. That's success. That's what it looks like to be. The culture's going to say you one thing. The world's going to say you one thing. But loving God and putting Him first, man, that's, that is a win. And incidentally, an awesome family like that is not accidental. In fact, nobody has an awesome family just because. There's no genetic predisposition that makes you have an awesome family. An awesome family is hard work, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. In fact, I want to use the word shape. How do we shape an awesome family? Because that's what it's like. When we're, when we're trying to cultivate this family and really make it all that it should be, it's like shaping something. Just the other day I was watching a video on the Internet, 
And it was about a guy. And it started off, and I don't know if you ever watch these how-to videos and stuff, but I'm always watching when someone's creating something. I don't know why. I just get trapped by it. But this guy starts with a stump. I mean, tree stump, full on, no kidding, stump. And he has a chainsaw, and he starts sawing on it. And then he starts grinding on it. And then he does this chisel, and he grinds some more. And, and I mean, this thing goes on and on. This guy, I don't know how much time he spent. He ground, and then he sanded, and then he did all this stuff. And finally, he pulls out some oil, and he wipes it down with oil. You know, you don't, they don't really let you see what it is till the end. And at the end, he'd made a, a giant solid wood Easter egg. I was like, oh, my gosh, all that. And in the end, he's going to come. Hey, here's what I've been working on all week, honey. Here's your solid wood Easter egg. What? Anyway, it was awesome, though. But you know what I realized? I was watching that guy. Dude was committed. I mean, from the beginning, he was committed to getting to that Easter egg in that stump. Now, I would say that he's probably used his time poorly, okay? We'd all agree that the end result of having a wooden Easter egg probably is not like way up there. But here's what I will say. Dude had the fortitude to see the egg in the stump before he got there, and he stuck with it. I think sometimes with our families, what we do is, is because we're so desiring instant results, we're not willing to stick with anything long enough or continue to pursue something long enough until it takes root, until it really holds on, until it really shapes and changes, until we really get there. And so we struggle with that. So what I want to do is I want to give you a few things, just three simple things that I think will shape our families. We're trying to get the Easter egg out of our stump. Um, Three things we ought to do. I feel good about that. That was pretty good. So anyway, an awesome family is shaped by one of the things that shapes us. We're shaped by what we stick to. What do we, what do we stick to? What, what, what do we consistently do as a family? Now, this can be a couple. This can be a family of 10, 4, 3, whatever, any number you want. But I want you to ask this question. What is something that we consistently stick to? Because what you stick to sets a priority. It says this is important. It says this matters. We're, gonna, we're doing this over and over and over. What are, we, what are we emphasizing? You know, in our culture, we've emphasized seatbelts for a long time, haven't we? To the point where now you get in a car, you feel bad if you don't put on your seatbelt. You know, back in the day, you could die in a fiery car accident with your seatbelt off if you wanted to, but not today. No, you got to put it on. You get in somebody else's car, and they'll just wait. They're like, and you're like, what? Put your seatbelt on. Okay. I feel like... You're a terrorist here all of a sudden. I want to just, what if I just want to ride here and just my body flop around the, the car when it wrecks? What if I want that? You can't. Why? Because seatbelts are really important. Or bike, bikes with helmets. Every once in a while I ride a bike, I know you look at me and go, I can tell. <laughs> I know. I know. No big deal. But we'll ride every once in a while, and every once in a while I'll forget my helmet. And if I forget my helmet, you know what I do? I ride my bike anyway. I do. I'll just go out there riding. But when you're on the river trail, some of you bikers are bullies. I mean, you'll ride, hey, get a helmet on. Who are you? Dude, if I want to split my cranium open on this sidewalk, I'll do whatever I want to. It's America, and I'll do it, right? But it's emphasized. Have you noticed what we hold on to? That becomes, and you know what? Now when I get my bike, I think about it. I've got to get my helmet. I'll forget my water bottle. Dehydrate out there. I can die of dehydration. <laughs> Nobody intimidates you over that. Nobody goes, hey, how, much, how come you don't have hydration? No. It's just you got something for your little grape, covering your little grape up there. That's all you got. I'm not real passionate, but I'm just saying stuff that we stick to sticks in our family. There's some stuff that we need to grab hold of. Listen to what Paul writes in Galatians 6. I love this. He says this. He says, so let's not get tired of doing what's good. He says, don't get tired of it. Listen to what he says. At just the right time, we'll reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. He's using some farming terms here. What he's saying is, Paul's saying, in the same way when you put that seed in the ground, the ground has to hold that seed for a certain amount of time before that seed can then begin to hold the ground. You know, when it comes to spiritual discipline, so often what happens with us is we don't hang on to the seed long enough for the seed to get a hold of us. We'll start into our little Bible study that lasts about three days. Listen, God did raise Jesus from the dead in three days, but for the Bible to get a hold of you and raise you from the dead, it's going to take more than three days. You've got to put the seed in the ground. You've got to hang on to it for a period of time. We all struggle with prayer time. I get it, man. I'm ADD. I got it. Dude, I'm the worst. God understands, though. That's what I do. I'll go right back into the prayer. I say, Lord, you know. You made me this way. That's why we had that little moment there. But I'm back, and we'll start talking again. But you know what we need to do? We need to hang on to something. In our family, what are we hanging on to? What do we need to hang on to? What do we need to stick with for a period of time so that it grows roots down in us? 
And then it begins to hang on itself. Paul says, you know what? There's some stuff that we really should get a halt on until, until it has a hold of us. What are the things that you're sticking with? Because the things that you stick with are going to bring about some kind of fruit. And you know what? For me, when I really start inventorying this message, there's some stuff that I consistently do that I go, ah, I don't know that I really want the long-term harvest of that. And I have to reevaluate whether that's something I want to hang on to. Maybe that's where you are. Maybe there's some things I'm not hanging on to that I need to hang on to because the harvest I need from that in the future, I need that. And so I need to go back to that commitment and say, wait a second, there's, I got to hang on to this. This is too important. Let's go back to it. We've tried this 27 times before. Let's go 28. We're going to go 28. And this time, I mean it. Seriously, we're going to do it. I love this. Joshua 24, 15 says, But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods of your ancestor, that your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. That's something we need to hang on to. Serving. Serving. I, you know what? I almost laugh a little bit because we're constantly, you see these, these videos downgrading Gen X, Gen X, Gen X, Gen X. You know what you get out of the generation? You get out of the generation, whatever generation that's coming up, you get out of it what you put into it. And you know what happened to Gen X? We didn't put a lot in. We didn't show them how to serve and love people and care about people. And I think Gen X is actually doing better than my generation, just to be quite honest with you. They're more sacrificial in a lot of ways than we were, and they're smarter for sure. So there's a lot of potential. You all got a lot of potential. Don't you know that? Potential. So keep, keep, stay right there, and things are going to go good. Um, but the truth is, is that what we did was we lived for ourselves and we passed that on. When our family's selfish and self-centered, then guess what? We're all going to be selfish and self-centered. How do we pass on this love and desire to care about other people is you have to serve other people. You do. That's something that we need to hang on to. It's something that's important. Hebrews 10, 25, look at this. And let us not neglect our meeting together. What Paul's talking about is this, what you're doing right now, getting out here on Sunday, getting it together. And we're going to worship and we're going to serve God and we're going to celebrate. We're going to laugh and we're going to praise God. And we're going to sing songs like, we are fan. Stuff like that. It's going to be awesome. I know. I know. I told them I could sing. <laughs> no one believes it. Um, he says, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Are you holding on to, to being here? Did you know that the average person who, who considers himself a church person in America goes to church once Every four months. <laughs> wow. That's commitment right there, isn't it? Did you know the average church person who considers himself a church member of that church? I'm talking about right here. I'm not talking about cabin. I'm talking about here comes once every six weeks. That means your commitment to God is one-sixth. God, you're important to me. Every sixth weekend, you know, I'm going to be there for an hour. Me and you, were like this. Tight, baby. That's what we, crazy, isn't it? I mean, it's crazy, but that's where we are. Can you imagine what kind of relationship you had if you only talked to somebody for like a half an hour every six weeks? Yeah, I'd be really close. Yeah, you barely know each other's names, but that's where we are. You know what would be cool? What if we committed to something greater than that? Because this, this gathering together is something that's important to us and it's important to God. You want to know why? Because this is dress rehearsal for heaven. This is what it looks like. All races, creeds, and colors coming together, worshiping the Almighty God, singing songs together, encouraging each other, hugging each other's necks. You know what? You can have a cruddy week, a terrible week, but you can come in here and somebody's going to look you in the face. Somebody's going to hug your neck. You're going to hear something encouraging. The Holy Spirit's going to show up. The Word of God's going to be preached. Worship's going to happen. And I promise you, you leave here better. We are always better having been in the presence of God. And we need to be committed to that. In a world that's not committed to much, we need to be committed to that. It's something that we need to hang on to as a family. And I've heard some people say, oh, man, you know, here's the thing. I don't take that church thing too far. You know, you take it too far, you get in trouble. Okay, first of all, I don't really see a bunch of people that go, man, I took church too far. Now my life's really screwed up. In fact, I'd love for you to introduce that person to me because I'd love to hear their story. Yeah, I was really committed to church and my life was terrible. You know, that's crazy, isn't it? That don't, That don't happen. It's like when I start trying to lose weight. Some people are like, hey, don't go too far. Yeah. Well, like skinny people are dropping dead all over the place, right? <laughs> yeah, don't you get, don't you get, we got school programs going out right now. All you skinny kids need to fluffing up because you're going to, no, it's crazy. 
You show me one person whose life has been messed up because they were overcommitted to church, and I'll show you 100 people who have blown the wheels off their life and their eternity because they weren't committed to God whatsoever in the context of his church. I'm going to tell you right now, you will never misserve yourself by being committed to the body that calls itself the body of Christ. You will never go wrong in being committed to what Jesus died for. You're never going to go wrong being committed to the organism and the organization in which God said, I will use as a vehicle to change the world. You're never going to go wrong with that, okay? It's never going to be wrong. You won't overdo it, all right? I promise you that. You just won't overdo it. There's some things that we need to hang on to. You know, a second thing, if we're going to shape a great family, what shapes our family is what we allow in. What are we allowing into our families? It's funny that in Proverbs 4.23, listen to what this says. God says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Our heart is what, we're, what, 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 what is inside of us that influences who we are. It's not the, the, the organ in your chest. It's how you see things. It's how you see the world. It's what you believe about the world. And did you know that what you believe about the world and how you see the world is influenced by what you let in, what you allow in here? And I wonder, it's kind of crazy that, that we sit around today and if someone fired up a cigarette in a restaurant, you'd panic because we've been programmed to believe, hey, secondhand smoke, dude, that's bad. Well, how dare you? You smoke in a restaurant? Are you kidding me? I'm trying to enjoy my chicken nuggets. You're firing up over there? That's crazy. Well, we'd have, a, we'd have the police come out. But we don't have a problem with secondhand sex. We'll go sit down in a movie and we'll watch two people have sex on the screen with our kids and everybody else there. And we're not bothered by that at all. We're worried about the repercussions, the possibility that we might get cancer because you're breathing somebody else's smoke coming off. But we're not the least bit concerned about how relationships and our perspective and our heart is changed by watching filthy, immoral junk. We don't have a problem with that. That's cool. You know how many people I've counseled with over the years? Married couples that can't get it together and they struggle dramatically. You want to know why? Because they were over-sexualized before they got married. And the one thing that was meant to hold them together is the one thing that comes between them. And by the way, if you're struggling with that, you are not unique and different. It is the norm. Because for too long, we've been concerned about secondhand smoke, but we hadn't been concerned about secondhand sex. You know, we're, we're, we're worried about, about wearing a seatbelt, but we're not worried about the recklessness of exposing our kids to a Hollywood that promotes nothing but materialism. Get all you can. Be as self-centered as you want to be because it's all about you. Man, what are we allowing in? What are we allowing into our family? What are we allowing into our heart? What are we seeing? What kind of habits are there that we're allowing in? Hebrews 12, 2 says this. I love it. It says, fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix. That means that it's a conscious decision that I will look at you. I will focus on you, Lord. It's about you. Fix your eyes on Jesus. It says, the author and the perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, what we're talking about is exposure. What, what are we exposing our heart to? What are we exposing our minds to? What are we exposing our family to? What are, what are we exposing? You know, I'll tell you this. I know this, and I'm a pastor. I can't cram Jesus down my family's throat. I can't make my kids love Jesus. I can't make them do that. I can't make my kids choose Christ. I can't make my kids want to serve God. But you know what I can do? I can control what they're exposed to. I can expose them to the beauty of life change through Christ. I can expose them to the joy of serving other people. I can expose them to the hardship of people in the world. Every single one of my kids at a certain point, and I've got a few kids now that I've got to add to this, we've gone on a mission trip. And I've taken them somewhere. Why? Because I want them to see the world. Not the world that you see on the vacation trip, but the world that you need to see that shows the poverty and the pain where there is an absence of God. I want them to see that. And I want them to see the hope that we carry and the privilege that we have and the opportunities that are in front of us. I want to expose them to the goodness of God's word and the truth of God's word. I want them to be exposed to those things. You know what? The world is not exposing that. You're throwing a cell phone to your 12-year-old and you're saying, just have at it. And you've opened up an open line of sewage into their brain. And, and you're just saying, hey, you know, they've all got one. Well, do you got to be just as bad a parent as the other people? No, it's bad. It's bad. You're messing them up. Bad. I like, hey, when the children are saying amen, you know we're on to something. So preach it. 
But he says, fix your eyes on Jesus, and we have to be considerate of what we're exposing our family to. And there's some stuff that we ought to say, you know what? That's just not healthy. I remember years ago, there was these commercials about carbon monoxide. I don't know if y'all remember that. And there's always carbon monoxide, you know, detectors and alarms and all that stuff. Remember that? And everybody's like, oh, it's the silent, deadly killer. Everybody's like, oh, my gosh, that can kill you. And you know what? You should be concerned about that because it will. You'll wake up dead. Bad news. That stuff's bad. It's true. But what are some things that we're inhaling and we're consuming, and we're allowing in, and we're just opening the door to it that needs to stop. You know what? I'm going to talk to you parents for a second. You got to start being a parent. Parent, being a parent, you're not popular. There's times your kids aren't going to like you. That's okay. Don't worry about it. I don't need my kids to like me. We, I didn't get in this for a popularity contest. I don't know how I got into it, to be honest with you, but I'm here. And we're going we're gonna to figure it out. You know why? Because I want what's best for them. And I want for them to see Jesus for who he is. And I want their life and their eternity to be where it should be. So there's going to be some things I'm going to say no to. There's times some of my kids go, yeah, I was going to ask you, but I knew you'd say no. I'm like, so what are you thinking about it then? <laughs> That's right. Then it should have already ended in your mind. Don't go to the other parent because we're, we're one flesh. Okay? So anyway. So what else, do, what else shapes our family? What we lift up. What do we celebrate? What makes your family go, yes, yeah, awesome? What makes you do that? What do you celebrate? What makes you bake a cake, throw a party, jump up and down? What makes you cry? I'm so proud, so excited. Look at this. Luke 15, 24 is the story of a, we call it the prodigal son, but it's really the story of a faithful father whose son leaves him, goes off to the foreign land, blows his inheritance, does some crazy living, but he comes to his senses and he comes back home and he asks for forgiveness. And the father's just blown away by it and he's excited about it. That's where this verse takes up. Verse 24 says, my son who was dead is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. What do you celebrate? See, because here's the truth. Whatever, Whatever you reward will remain in your kids' lives. Whatever you celebrate becomes permanent. Whatever excites you, there's not a kid anywhere. I know that, that we, some of us have got some bad history with our parents and stuff, but the truth is we are hardwired innately with this desire to please our parents. We want to do something that makes them smile. And what made dad clap? What made dad jump up and down? What made dad go, that is awesome, whether you know it or not? What, what made mom laugh? What made mom tear up? What, what did mom celebrate? Because whether you know it or not, that shapes our lives as kids. And in your own family, what makes your wife excited? What makes your husband elated? You know, what we celebrate becomes permanent. It's, it's so, so important. And I thought about some things, and I'm just comparing them. And I'm not saying that you have to do one or the other. I'm just saying, what if we celebrated salvation and life change the way we celebrate sports and scoring? What, what if we were as excited about our kids knowing Jesus and sharing Christ and studying God's word as we are of them hitting a ball off of a tee or doing a dance move on a stage. Just what if? Don't don't leave here and go, oh, that's right, he's anti-sport. I might be a little, but that's not what this is about. Okay? The truth is is that what if? What if if we did that? Because what you're celebrating right now, your kids are going to take with them forever. And whether you know it or not, some of those celebrations are embracing in your kid I matter if I look a certain way and perform a certain way. Because that's when the claps come. That's when the celebration happens. But what about when they experience life change? Do we celebrate it the same way? How about this spiritual exercise? What if we celebrate as much as we celebrate physical exercise? What if we celebrated Bible study as much as we celebrate homework? What if we celebrated church participation as much as we celebrated class participation? What's going to last? What's going to last after their life's over? What's going to last after you're gone? What do you want them to lean into as an adult? I'm going to tell you something. Mathematics can never get you through a life crisis. Social studies, it's never going to mend a broken marriage. History... It's never going to cause somebody to know the eternal rewards of a committed relationship to Jesus. It's not going to do it. So what are we celebrating? We celebrate physical birthdays. Have you ever thought about how silly that is a little bit? We're going to have a cake and celebrate because you're here. I mean, 
yeah, give us a speech. Oh, yes, when I walked out of the birthing canal, I was exhausted. I was covered in all that stuff, you know, like a greased weasel. And, man, I was, couldn't see a thing. Man, it was hard getting here. We celebrate that and give them presents. But, but what about the day that they step across the line and say, I no longer want to stand on my own, but I need a Savior. And I'm putting my life in his hands and I'm choosing to live for Jesus. What about that? That's worth celebrating, y'all. I'm not saying stop having birthday parties, okay? So don't leave here and say, that's it. We're not buying you a cake. No, oh, I'm not saying that. But here's what I am saying, though. Have you thought about the stuff that we celebrate that's temporary versus the stuff that we need to be celebrating that is much more permanent and maybe much more important? We have a chance to do those kind of things. What we reward, it's going to remain. Our kids are going to stick with it. You know, for me, um, when I was a kid, we played sports. And I'm not being anti-sports, but let's just tell you my story. We won three state championships in elementary school. My team did three years in a row. Um, we were the state champions, and by the, that, at, back in that day, we had one unified whatever organization, and our team won it three years in a row. We were the state. We were on television. We were written up in the paper. You didn't know I was a sports, you know, like authority here, right? You're like, man, I didn't know that guy was so awesome. True story. I was a running back back then, too, believe it or not. I was just running scared, but I was good because I didn't want to get tackled. I was horrified of getting hurt, so I ran like I stole something, but... The truth is, is that we won three years in a row. You know what? I got tons of trophies. I had trophies that were giant trophies, man. We got a chance to go to this awards banquet. We had the governor come. Had all kinds of great things happen. Three championships in a row, man. I got a football that was covered in glitter. Coolest thing you've ever seen. But you know what I never did? Not one time did I ever play catch with my dad. Not one time. I knew, I knew how to play football. I knew how to hit the hole when I was in elementary school. But you know what I didn't know how to do? I didn't know how to pray. I, I, I knew how to, I had a, we had to push to the end. I knew how to hit that dude. I knew how to tackle. I knew how to break a tackle. I knew how to read the defense. I knew that stuff in elementary school. I knew it. But I didn't know how much God loved me, and I didn't know what his word said. You know, we're raising up a generation that are going to have irrelevant skill sets. I can't think of a single time in my life that I have leaned into my experiences as an elementary state championship football player. Not one time. Not once. Am I saying that you can't play football, it's no good? No, but what I'm saying is give it its proper position. It's entertainment and it doesn't compete with Jesus because it's not even close. You live in a world that is majored on making something that's not important way too important. There are some things that are important to our kids, and there's some things that are important to our family, and there's some things that shape our family. You need to be shaping your family based on eternal things, not temporary junk. I would much rather today have spent an afternoon in the front yard throwing the football with my dad than being in the newspaper. I'd much rather have that. And I bet your kids would too. As you're putting on their dance outfits, as you're putting on their little ball team uniforms, and as you're running after these other crazy things, it's not the same thing. Our family is going to be shaped. It's going to be shaped by what we lift up and what we celebrate. And you know what? There's some things that are important. You want an awesome family? Let's make some awesome investments. Let's do some things that God's taught us in his word that are ironclad and solid. I think if we do these things, it'd be huge. I think it'd change a lot of stuff. Man, I want to pray with you. And I want us to take a second just to let some stuff soak in. Let us have a second to kind of understand what God's saying. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Don't be looking around for just a second. God says three things are going to last. Faith, hope, and love. That's it. Nothing else will. Faith, hope, and love. They last. What am I doing in my family to emphasize these things? What am I holding on to? What are we doing consistently? What are we sticking with? What am I allowing in? What are we allowing just to, to seep through that we're not really looking at and going, wow, that could, that could affect us? And what are we celebrating? What are we lifting up? What makes us cheer, jump up and down? I think if we think about these things, I think we'd be amazed at what we're shaping our family for. 
Maybe we need to make some commitments to make some changes. Maybe we need to get back in line with what's important. You know, it all starts with a relationship with Jesus. That relationship, we enter into that relationship knowing that we can't fix ourselves and that we're broken hopelessly without him. And we enter that relationship and we say, God, I can't fix this, but I need you. And maybe that's where you are. Maybe you're sitting on top of some brokenness that you can't repair. It's a great place to be because that's the place where we can reach out to Jesus and put our mess in his hands and allow him to do something great. If you're ready for that, why don't you pray with me? Just where you sat, just something simple like this. Just say something like this to God. Just repeat these words silently and God hears you. Just say, Lord, I need you. I can't fix myself. I need your forgiveness. I need your salvation. I need you, Jesus, more than anything. Today, I trust you as my Savior. I know that there's no way that my life can change without you. Take control of me, Lord Jesus, today. I want to follow you. Thank you for dying for me. And thank you for loving me. I offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, I pray for each person in this room, God, as we consider these words, Lord, as we think about having an awesome family, there's some choices, some conscious choices we have to make. God, I pray, Lord, that we'll have the courage to to move some things around, God, that are out of place, that we'll be willing to establish some traditions and hang on to some stuff that really, really matters. I pray also, God, that, that we're willing to at least look at the way we filter stuff that comes into our lives, God. And then, God, may we celebrate the eternal things, the important things, the things that are of you. Lord, we love you. And we thank you for all things. And we offer this prayer. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Scott. Wasn't that such an awesome message? Yeah, I tell you what, we have to remember as we move forward throughout the rest of this week that an awesome family is based off what we commit to, what we stick to, what we allow in. And I feel like, you know, as, as families, there are so many things I feel like in culture that are coming against us, but they don't have to come against us. We can be prepared and we can know. Um, and, we, and being involved in the church is one of the best places to start. If you've got your family here this morning and maybe you don't, maybe you need to get them here, but this is a great place to start. And so furthermore than that, you know, if you accepted Christ today, we want to celebrate that with you. And we want to just come alongside you and support you as you just move through this discipleship process. It does no good if you come here and you pray a prayer and you think, okay, that's great. I'm done. No, you've got to get plugged in. You know, this is a great place and we've got so many different opportunities for you to just connect with one another and grow in that discipleship process. It's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. And that church is a great place for that to happen. So if you committed your life to Jesus today, fill out your Connect card, hand that to one of the guest services volunteers before you leave today, and stop by our Next Steps booth. And I know that the Abby and Bree, they'll be out there. We've got baptism coming up on May the 5th. So that's awesome. And that's a great opportunity, a great next step to take. So you can mark your Connect card or you can visit with them on your way out. A few uh, quick things, you know, part of knowing Jesus and making him known here at that church is through the Everywhere Project and through something very exciting that we have launching this fall, our church leadership school. Who's excited about CLS? Yes. Well, I've got a special guest that's going to come out here, Mr. Jerron Hall. If you could give him a round of applause real quick. Thank you, Jessica. Hey, good morning, everybody. Listen, I just want to take a little bit of your time. If you have ever thought about going into ministry or being a part of a church plan, I urge you, on your Connect card, there's a place marked CLS. Mark that. Give us your name, address, email address, and your phone number. If you do that, meet me out in the crossing. There's a CLS booth, and I've got a free gift for you, all right? Listen, thank you guys so much for your time. I hope that you have a great day, and God bless all of you. Thanks, Sharon. 
Awesome. So before you go, I've got a couple quick announcements and just following up on CLS. You know, I think sometimes we think that like college students or like high school students are the only ones who suffer the fact of like, well, I really don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. Is anyone else out there, adults out there? Okay. Well, maybe you're kind of finding yourself in this place of like, I, I don't know, I'm not really content where I am right now. And I feel like God may be stirring me to do something else. Maybe it's CLS, maybe it's not, but why not give it a shot? You just really don't know unless you give it a try. And so I just encourage you to pray about that and consider that. The deadline is coming up before too long. So just make sure and stop by and see Jerron on your way out today. So who knows what next week is? Easter. Okay, so everyone kind of has a heads up on that. So next Saturday at Sylvan Hills Football Field at 10 o'clock in the morning, we are going to be dropping 21,000 eggs from a helicopter. It sounds a little crazy. It is. So we're just going to practice real quick. I, I want you all to get your kids pumped for this this week. So on the count of three, really loud, three times, we're going to say, drop those eggs. Okay, you ready? We got to practice. We got to get ready. So on the count of three, one, two, three, drop those eggs, drop those eggs, drop those eggs. All right. It's going to be awesome. But more than just an egg hunt, it is going to be an opportunity to get people from our community in our seats the next day. Okay. It's not just about filling a building. It's about saving lives. Believe it or not, not everyone you come into contact with knows Jesus. Okay, believe it or not. So next week is a great opportunity to get them in the door. And more than likely, if they don't have a church home, they're already thinking about where they're gonna go next week. So they might as well come here. You got an invite card on your way in today. And I tell you what to do with those invite cards. You can really freak people out a little bit, but it's kind of fun. Last week, we had an insurance salesman that came to our door. And if you're here today, great, the card worked. But we had an insurance salesman that came to our door and he was trying to sell us insurance. We already had insurance. That was great. But I thought, you know what? Landon was still standing at the door and we just really like to make friends. So if we haven't met you yet, we would love to. But we like to make friends. And I thought, you know, I've got one of those cards sitting on the kitchen table. I'm just going to go grab it real quick. And so sure enough, uh, we asked him if he had a church home. He didn't sell us any insurance, but we invited him to church. So take some cards with you. They work, and whether or not they come, you know what, you're doing the groundwork. We've got five services next week. Our normal services in the morning at 8.30, 10, and 11.30 a.m. And then in the afternoon, if you are a regular attender, we would ask that you would help us open some seats, like I said, for people in the community that don't know Jesus. We've got extra services at 1 p.m. and 2.30 p.m. And during those services, our kids' ministry are gonna be doing an egg hunt for our kids. So that's just a little something special that we're gonna be doing next week. But we are so excited to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus with you. And a couple more things, like I said, baptism is coming up on Sunday, May the 5th. Get signed up for that. Real Women and Point Man is back in session. Who? Yes. Last week, Pastor Scott, like I said, he talked about making some awesome friends. So if you haven't gotten connected there, that's a great place to build some awesome friendships. And then Mother's Day is coming up just two short weeks after Easter. So I just encourage you, get your mom here. Maybe if she doesn't already come with you or whatever, maybe she does. Um, but just get her here. We've got a lot of special treats that are going to be available for our moms and just to celebrate moms. And so we encourage you to just invite your family and plan to be here on Mother's Day. Day. So thank y'all so much for being patient with me this morning. Y'all are dismissed. Have a great Sunday and we'll see you on Easter.